This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing in our Bible study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins, that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us so we can benefit the most out of our study. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts, open minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's begin by looking at what we have translated so far and studied. Now, let me remind you that these translations are sometimes more word for word than you'll see in your uh, normal uh, translations you'll find that you buy at the Bible store or wherever you get your Bible. But uh, we want to understand the reason I do this is because it is a better teaching tool. So it'll sound a little awkward when I read it, but I'll try to read it in a way that it's meant to be read. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers, remembering your faith, your work of faith, and labor of love, and endurance of hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father, knowing, brethren, loved of God, your election. Now in chapter 1, verse 5, the next verse, Paul is going to write of the evidence of their election. <clears throat> Let me read the translation first, then we'll come back and interpret it. Verse 5, Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved among you for your sakes. The one word I want to look at here that I want us to get a little deeper understanding is, is the phrase with deep conviction. Plera Thoria. Plera Thoria. Full assurance most certain confidence, completely certain of something. The point being that the apostles are deeply convicted of the truth that they believe and what they live by. So that's the kind of thing, and that's the way I translate it that way, so you'll understand what Paul is writing. Now, this verse begins to give us some of the evidence of the Thessalonians' election. Let's take it a point at a time. Let me put the verse up there and I'll read the points to you. The evidence of their election. When the apostolic team came to the Thessalonians, a number of them responded. When the Holy Spirit moves upon a people and they become saved, they receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, they receive their spiritual gifts, and they take to the Bible doctrine, the teaching right away, things begin to happen. So we see that when the gospel came, it came in power. It had an impact on these people. Changes were made in their lives, in their actions, and we'll see that they did a lot of things right. Now let's look at our phrase, deep conviction, point two. With deep conviction, Paul and his team taught with power and intensity. Their lives reflected not only their, change, their own changed lives, but they labored as models to these believers, out to risk it all in the most serious of missions. To advance the kingdom of God. 
I think when we realize as Christians how serious our mission is and our responsibility to get the gospel out, to grow spiritually, to develop our spiritual gifts if need be, and begin to use them, we'll find ourselves in a position that is not only very responsible, but is quite serious. We want people to grow spiritually. We want people to be saved. We want God glorified from what we do. 1 Corinthians 2.4 This wasn't new to Paul. 1 Corinthians 2.4 My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now let me just add this personal note, not so much from me, but as to you. When you decide to really get serious about responding to God's truth, things will begin to change because the Word of God works. It has the power of God behind it. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you and the Spirit will take this Word and actively work in your heart and when I say heart, if you've been with us in our studies, that includes your mind, your emotions, your values. It keeps that sin nature under control and allows the Holy Spirit to rule in your life. Our third point from this verse The Thessalonians witnessed day after day what kind of men the apostles were. When I say apostles, I mean the men that was with Paul. All right, so I'm not trying to identify these men as apostles, though they certainly seem to function like apostles to a, to a great degree. They saw them work. They saw them teach to reach out, to stand for truth against the opposition, the religious leaders, those who opposed them. And they, ex and they examined the scriptures along with these people to try to prove to them what they had to say. And there was a persuasiveness that was going on here. But it wasn't the type of preaching persuasiveness that they used. They reasoned with their audience to try to show them what the truth had to say. Now, I don't want to uh, sound like I'm too critical of preaching, but preaching, as it is commonly accepted today, is pretty shallow on the teaching end. Uh, ideally, good preaching would include teaching. But today, preaching has become such an art that it's almost like you're trying to persuade people what the Word of God means rather than proclaim it. So that's what I'm trying to get to. The element of proclamation should be in your teaching. You're telling people what God's Word says. And this is what Paul and the Apostles did. And as they did that, they would take the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. Remember, all they had at this point was the Old Testament. They could take the Old Testament Scriptures and show them by looking at it with them or reading it with them that Jesus was the Messiah and they would then pull out scriptures that they had uh, from other passages and begin to show them that this was the time of the new covenant that things have changed and then from their own testimony they could tell the Holy Spirit and what was happening in other churches and every time Paul got to go, go to a group of people and, and they, were in, they were converted, they began to grow spiritually, they began to form up a church, this was great evidence that a new program was coming in to the Jewish people. Many rejected it. This is pretty much a carryover from them rejecting the Messiah. So, 
The point is that as these churches begin to form and grow, they begin to spread. Disciples making disciples, that's the way it's supposed to be. So as Paul continued to go out further on his missionary journeys, some people even already heard of him and heard what was going on, as we will see in this letter. But this was typical of the lion-hearted Apostle Paul. He was determined to get the word of God out, pioneering through the Roman Empire, going to places that few would go with a contrary message in those Jewish synagogues. He spread the gospel. Can you imagine being a Jew in a synagogue, let's say over in a at Philippi or something like that, and realizing that the Messiah had come and you didn't even know it? And not only that, he had been here for 33 years. And not only did you not know it, but you didn't even heard about him dying. And then when someone comes along and ties this in, what awe you must have been in, or you that you would be in, if you were truly responding to truth. So what happens is, a lot of these Jews just couldn't handle this. And we will see that a lot of Gentiles that didn't have this luggage with them were able to respond. So Paul would go out and he would establish these churches, and the thing that he did that was so vital to the health of these churches is that he would follow up. He would continue to make sure that these people were being fed the word. He would send his assistants back. At times he would send letters until these men who were in these churches who had the gifts of teaching would get established and be able to sort things out on their own. Now when the Thessalonians jumped on board, they started making disciples themselves so that there was a multiplication in numbers and spiritual growth. Now we've already looked at the map, but let's just sort of picture the, the Greek peninsula there, some of the, the inlet there. We have Thessalonia about right here. And then as they began to spread out, people go tell their families. Remember, it was on a major roadway, the ignition the Via Ignitia went through here. Uh, they would go out and they could go to the villages and tell their friends and their neighbors and the word was getting out throughout the Greek Peninsula. Athens is down here. Okay. So eventually the word was getting out that Jesus was the Messiah. So they would hit these villages knowing that not only was this what they were supposed to do, but they wanted to do it. So... As Jesus had predicted, as disciples make disciples, the message goes out throughout the world. The Thessalonians were doing their part. Multiplication in numbers and spiritual growth. And when this happens, the Bible tells us heaven rejoices. It also tells us the angelic world is stirred. And God moves with these people. Now, I don't know how often this happens today. I often hear people talk about the spirit moved or this or that happening. I'm not so sure if we're talking about the same thing. But when God works in a person's heart, there's a change. Not only in how he thinks, how he lives, but how he serves God. And these Thessalonians, many of them, took their service quite seriously. Um, if you've ever been determined to do something, determined to tell somebody something because it was very uh, critical to their hearing that news, this is the way they looked at it. You've got to hear this. Sit down. Let's get serious. I need to talk to you about something really important, you see. Not only this, but they faced no less than four lines of opposition. They had the religious crowds to deal with. 
that's the Jews. The Jews with all the traditions and teachings and misunderstandings of the law. Not all wrong, but many. At the same time, rejecting the Messiah. There were the city officials. These were those who basically ran the city and the religious Jews, when they didn't like somebody in town or they thought someone was teaching something they didn't like, they would go to the officials and try to get them to somehow penalize those who were speaking. That's what happened with Paul. The religious Jews went over to the city officials and claimed that Paul was violating Caesar's decree. That there was another king. Well, that's true. Paul would say that. But that's just a way of trying to get him in trouble. When the city officials came along and found out, they basically let Paul and his uh, people go. Uh, that actually happened to, uh, not Paul, but it was actually Jason who Paul apparently had taught at his house, and they came and arrested him. The third line of opposition was the Roman authorities themselves. Now, that may include some city's officials, but this is, since a magistrate is in this town, it is probably as likely a place that there was uh, perhaps a Roman uh, station there for the military as well as a place for the <clears throat> Roman government rulers to rule from. The fourth line of opposition would be the city folk. Now you say, well, now why would the city people give them a problem? Well, think about it. We're talking about Rome. Not only that, we're talking about a Greek province in Rome and not only they have their own gods the Greek traditions but they have the Roman gods so you have all these gods you've heard about them in mythology but they took these things fairly seriously they would put in idols into their homes they would have their own little place of worship where they could go and worship their idol uh, they could go, uh, they might worship by getting drunk or participating in some immoral activities. So you can imagine that some of these <clears throat> worship halls were quite active. Now, Paul and Silas and Timothy came in and stood their ground and taught truth. They explained the scriptures to whoever would listen and even trying to persuade others by examining the scriptures with them. Here's a point of application. If one is to teach seriously, then you have to go into detail. Now the reasons are many. We'll see that in this epistle because a less than detailed teaching can lead to some false teaching. Even if you have to go word by word to make it clear, it should be done. Now there are a number of false teachings today that are floating around in well, what many would call evangelical churches. Some are very harmful. Others are not so harmful, um, and it's hard to say that because all false teaching is harmful, but there are some that's more devastating when it has to do with the false gospel. Uh, I'm not talking about differences of opinion on eschatology and, and things like that, but uh, there is so much false teaching going on today in the churches but that some churches themselves basically become a cult. Uh, that's hard to accept sometimes, but if there's that kind of activity going on, then you have gotten so far away from the Word of God that it needs to be completely either leave or the church needs to be cleaned out, so to speak. Well, Paul and his team has led the way. They face deadly opposition. They have carried with them a deep conviction that their message was what people needed to hear and they were going to tell it to the world. But 
like anybody with a good strategy, they knew they couldn't go to every village and talk to every person in every synagogue. So their idea is to make disciples. And we see this in the way the Thessalonians did what they did. So what we know they did to the Thessalonians is that they trained the people. They showed them, here's what the scripture says, here's where we got it, here's what it means. So, they made disciples who carried on the work after they left. In fact, we will see how the Thessalonians even got ahead of the apostles in some areas. Verse 6. Paul writes, you have become imitators of us and the Lord. Having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. He says, you also became imitators of us and the Lord. Now, how did they do that? Well, the first thing we see is they received the word in much tribulation. The word for tribulation, a rather frequent word, philipsis, literally it means a pressing together. But metaphorically, we understand it as affliction or distress. So under distress, under affliction, under pressure from numerous outside sources, they still, now listen, they still received the word. And when I say received, that means they heard the word and they believed it. They would not let anything stop them from learning God's word. They saw the word of God as critical to their daily life. I can expect that they did Bible study, as we would call it today, every day. As long as it was possible. So, they received the word even when there was a lot of pressure on them. Important lesson here, when you are under pressure, under affliction, being oppressed, whether it be from people, uh, the world, or the devil, you keep on receiving the word. This is your spiritual nourishment. This is your daily bread. And the nice thing we see at the end of this verse, they did it, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. A fruit of the Spirit is joy. And this is clear evidence of a people who are living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Who are starting to grow spiritually. They take in the word. And as they grow in the word. They're controlled by the Spirit. There's a joy. So that before long, it's a real joy studying God's Word. And you know, that's the way it should be with us. We should enjoy studying God's Word. I've been in a church or two where I just couldn't hardly wait for the speaker to preach. And I say preach because when this guy spoke, he taught. He fed us. We knew this is where we were supposed to be. We knew this is what we were supposed to hear. And we knew that we were doing what God wanted us to do. So the excitement was in the air as we anticipated what our lesson was tonight. It's hard to find those churches nowadays. Well, 
Well, Paul also writes that they were imitating the Lord. One of the points that Paul brings out more than once about imitation. Imitation of Christ, imitation of mature believers is a sure sign of spiritual growth. Ephesians 5.1, Paul writes, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. Philippians 3.17, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. So notice how following the example of others is a way we learn. Now, with that in mind, who was the one that the disciples followed? Whose example did they follow? Who did they listen to? Who did they watch? And the way that, yes, our Lord treated people, confronted the Pharisees, dealt with small children, healed the sick, worked with the spiritually wounded. Jesus was an expert. So many of the disciples had the great advantage of learning from the best there ever was. And when you do that, you come out prepared. Now the Apostle Paul had specialized training we know he saw the Lord. We know he went off to Arabia to learn the word. And I expect there he got a great deal of specialized training, perhaps from the Lord himself. But he was there preparing for some length of time. Of course, the other apostles, Paul, I mean Peter and John and, and the like, they too would be ready to go. Jesus trained his people to carry on his mission. That is what we are to do as Bible teachers, as those gifted to do so, both inside and outside the church. We want to make disciples. And one of the ways to do that is to be an example to people. Take the Word of God, your time in the Word, your study of the Word seriously. People often ask, what is God's will? Or what should I be doing? It, and that just doesn't come from the younger crowd either. Well, the simplest answer, and always accurate, is you learn the word. If you don't know what to do, then it may be time just to sit down and do nothing but learn God's word. So you'll know the principles and begin to apply them. And as you do that, things begin to move for you. By that I mean God begins to work in your life and you see Him making your path. Now, when you begin to follow those principles of the Word and you learn them and you obey them, you apply them, this is imitating our Lord. We're learning His minds and His thoughts and we follow through by acting upon them. A couple of the verses in Thessalonians. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. You see, the disciples worked on the side from what this seems to say. Uh, if not for their own financial need, perhaps for the financial need of others. Uh, we're familiar with Paul being a tent maker. And then he worked his way through ministry in many cases, but he took donations also, you might say, and sometimes he passed them on to others. So the apostles, uh, the team there, worked their jobs, they taught the word, they enjoyed the fellowship of other Christians. And when needed, they'd pass on financial help to poor believers. They'd pray for the sick. Encourage their brothers and sisters in Christ. They set examples. 
they spread the word, the good news of Christ, and they also suffered. They were examples in suffering, how to take it. You see, the Christian life is not just about being somebody. Like so many people want to be today. They want to be somebody. They want to be noticed. They want to have their few seconds of fame. We're not here to make it a better world. And that rather shocks some people. What do you mean you're not here to make a better world? You know, if we have an impact for Christ, it would be a better world. Not the world. The world's in the devil's control. What you're going to change is people's hearts as they hear the word and respond to Jesus, and then they will deal with the world as they need to. We're not trying to get what we can out of life. Clearly, we're not supposed to be storing up treasures here on earth. But the Christian life is about simple things. Work your job. Raise your family. Study the Word. Grow spiritually. Use your spiritual gifts. Take time to pray and worship. I don't know about you, but just those few things fill my day. Yes, I might slip off and watch a ball game or something, but that's really after I've pretty much exhausted myself in all the other areas. Well, if there's a playoff game, I might make it a priority for some of my time, but that's rare. But this type of approach to life, pagans were being saved. Those under the law were moving to the life of grace and a power to live that life. Then those who were unsaved, as they heard the gospel, they received a new life entirely, born again and dwelt by the Spirit of God and a joy and a peace like never before. Not to mention joining into a family of brothers and sisters who shared the most important thing in their lives, a love for Christ. And then there was the opposition and the suffering that came for something that was well worth suffering for. Something more important, so important that the world could not understand, so they made them suffer for it. Well, they stood for something so important. Now the Thessalonians believers came very good at this. How do we know? Verse 7, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. If you recall the map, that was the area on down into the rest of the Greek peninsula. This means that the good news was getting out. People were traveling to nearby cities and some further away. So the word is getting out. Not only about Christ, but the word was getting out about what these believers were doing as these believers went out from Thessalonica. They went into these other areas. These people were hearing about the Thessalonians what the disciples, what the uh, apostolic team had done back in Thessalonia. So the word is getting out. Now Achaia was right down in this area of the peninsula. Macedonia is up in here. And they became examples in these two regions. So when Paul and his team would go into to one of these regions, perhaps one of these cities, he would go in and already hear about the Thessalonians. I can just see him walk into a synagogue and they say, oh, that's Paul. Oh, yeah, Paul, he's the one 
who the Thessalonians told us about. And you can just see that smile on his face. You see, that reflected the work of his team and how the Spirit was moving among those people. The imitation doesn't end there. Verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. <laughs> Let's look at this phrase for the word of the Lord. Important word, actually important phrase in the scripture, both Old Testament and New. Hologos to kuriu, the word of the Lord. It's a common expression in the Old Testament, often used for what the Lord God had said. The word of the Lord came to me, or is coming to you. Um, let's carry it over into the New Testament. The meaning behind it is that this is the very word of God. Let's look at some of the places we see it in the Old Testament. This is interesting. In the Old Testament, it was the word of the Lord that came to Abram. Genesis 15, 1 and 4. Moses spoke the word of the Lord to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 5, 5, Joshua 8, 8. I swear he spoke it to Joshua also, the word of the Lord came to the prophets, to Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 10, to Nathan, 2 Samuel 7, 4, and I've just scratched the surface here. It is the word of the Lord that is upright in Psalm 33, 4, that made the heavens in Psalm 33, 6. So the word of the Lord becomes a technical expression that refers to a proclamation or a decree of God. Often it was a prophetic utterance or his will. As we move to the New Testament, it carries the same heavy and absolute authority. Peter and John proclaimed the word of the Lord, Acts 8.25. Paul and Barnabas spoke the word of the Lord, Acts 13.44. The word of the Lord spread, Acts 13.49. And here in our verse we see, let's look at it again. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. That's a great expression. It sounded forth. It's like, here it is. The word of the Lord, it sounds forth. So it reverberates through the country. It's a perfect passive indicative telling us that the, words had, the word has already sounded forth so that the emphasis now is on the results. So now, now that it's hit all these people, they're starting to see the results of what's happening in these churches. It's like blowing a large horn. And the reverberations just continue on and on and on. And it keeps spreading out and spreading out and spreading out. So then a short time that it's been since Paul and his team have left the Thessalonians. The word has sounded out from the Thessalonians into many villages and communities in and around Greece. Those Roman provinces that were once known as Greece. So, not only did their lives set examples, but they told people of the Lord. 
Now remember that it was routine for Paul to go into the synagogues first, announce and prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's where you would go. That just makes perfectly good sense. That's where the God-fearers are. That is, those who know something of the true God. He would show them the scriptures. Some would reply or respond. Some would not. Now, many of these believers must have been dedicated Jews who made the change to become a believer. And if you can imagine, similar to the Apostle Paul, hard chargers for God became hard chargers for Jesus. So they would go out to other synagogues, perhaps men that they had trained or they had trained under, to go out and tell them, hey, we got a big update. Think of it. You'd want your friends to know, your family members to know, anyone who would listen. And this is a good lesson to see how rapidly the gospel spread into all the world by both word of mouth and people's lives. This is a good example of what to do. And they did such an outstanding job that the apostles did not even have to go to some of those places. The word had already got there. And if they did happen to go there, many had already heard of Paul. And what does Paul write into this? So that we do not, that we have no need to say anything. Now that's quite a testimony. Verse 9, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. First part of this sentence says, for they themselves, this is the people in the communities. These believers already know about the apostles visiting back in Thessalonica. They've already gotten word how the Thessalonians had turned away from idols. And they were seeing how they were now living, serving to, serving a living and true God. These believers that the Thessalonians had contacted knew of what Paul and his team had done and how the Thessalonians had turned from idols toward the living and true God. So what we see here is a clear testimony of the powerful impact of the team's ministry and the response they were getting and how that multiplied through the regions. Let me say that again. What we see here is a clear testimony of the powerful impact of the team's ministry and the response they were getting and how that multiplied through the regions. A few things to see here, a couple of points. The Thessalonians made it their goal to get out and spread the word. This is one major way in which they imitated Paul's team and the Lord. They spread the news of Jesus Christ and the power and the Holy Spirit. And these people were living in the control of the Holy Spirit under his power. Have you ever been to a church and it seemed like it was powerless? Well now, here's what I want you to understand. People often misconstrue the power of the Spirit with emotion. Just because it's exciting 
it doesn't mean that the spirit is working there. And what you have today, and it's sad to say that many churches have substituted emotion for the power of the Spirit. So that you have a a complete fraud going on. You have a substitute for the Spirit of God working among His people. For the preaching, the teaching, the proclamation of God's Word and sound doctrine is replaced by entertainment, stories, jokes, feel-good lessons. That's substituted for the truth. For the Spirit, you have emotion. A lot of it. You have music that is meant to move the emotions. And people often mistaken that for God at work. This is the kind of activity that went on in the pagan temples. The emotionalism. The entertainment. The social activity that went on. That was typical of a pagan temple. You get the same thing in a, a sports bar today. The emotionalism, the social activity. You know, we have to be serious about God's Word, as we can see here how, where it comes into our discernment. A second point we see here is the Thessalonians are said to have turned from idols. That would include their city idols, their personal idols, the, the national idols, the fact that they were not seeing the emperor as a god anymore, which tells us that many of these converts were Gentiles. Idol worship wasn't a big problem with the Jews so much. But this was Gentiles who were turning to God also. And that must have been something to see from the standpoint of a Jew who had just turned to Jesus as the Messiah to see that the Gentiles were in on it too. You see, Peter, Peter has spread that message, but no telling how far that's gone out at this point. We have the word for turned, where they turned to God from idols. The word epistrepho, it means to turn, to turn oneself. This is an action that begins in one's thinking. He mentally makes a decision that he no longer wants to follow the idol. And that he turns and makes a complete turn to God. This is basically what you do when you become saved. You turn for whatever you're depending on, whether it be yourself or some works. Or perhaps you're very much into the world and Satan's system. And you turn from that and you turn to God. And not only that, you turn to serve a living and true God. Don't miss that point. Because when you decide to serve one, someone, you have decided to submit. You have decided to put yourself at someone's disposal so they can use you. And you know what that includes? Commitment. I don't think there's an E on that. Commitment. Okay? Commitment. You have decided to commit. Commitment. I got in a hurry there. Let me get this right. Commit. M E N T. Okay? Commitment. You've decided to turn yourself over. 
when you decide to serve someone. Now this would include one's outward actions also, not only in his mind does he turn, but he also begins to do things. Do you think he would still go to the temples and play their little games and be involved in that? No, he'd turn from that. That was past him now. He doesn't get into that activity. He knows what it leads to. He knows that's what God does not want him to do. That's some of the simple decisions you make once you become a Christian. You stop doing the things that are obviously wrong. This is part of repentance. Turning from what is false to what is true. Paul writes to Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3.16 about turning, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There's a complete turning to God. This is one of the first, one of the best patches as I know of on what it means to really turn. It's in Acts 26, 17, and 18, where Paul is talking to King Agrippa about his own conversion on the road to Damascus. And then he includes in this explanation, I can't say it, explanation to King Agrippa what he does when he goes out and preaches the gospel. He got this word from Jesus. This is what he was supposed to do. Listen to what he tells King Agrippa. And I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. Now this is Jesus speaking to Paul. Okay. And I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn. Turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I view this as basically an elaboration on what repentance is. You're turning from, notice the first part, you open your eyes. The light has gotten in. Truth has gotten in, and you go from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that you may receive forgiveness of sin and be sanctified by faith. This is what happened with the Thessalonians. It brings us to our third point. Probably lost track of the points already. The first had to do with the Thessalonians making their goal to get out and spread the word. The second is they turn from idols, all kinds of idols. The third point, after turning from idols, the Thessalonians did two things. First, they turned in their turning to serve the living and true God the God that they had turned themselves over to in order to serve and to live a life of submission to God. So the first thing they did, they turned to serve the living and true God. Let's talk about the living God for a moment. Present active participle of Zao. Presently living, present tense, present active participle. The currently living God, he's living right now. This God is alive in contrast to those dead and empty idols. He's also described as the true God. The adjective, alathenos, the real, genuine God. This is in contrast to the false gods. The false gods of idol worship. Today, we would say the false gods of idols, whether it be a person or activity or something that we live for other than God. Verse 9, one more time. 
For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Now verse 10 turns into quite a long study in itself. Let me just read it. Now, one reason I want to read it is because this is the second thing we saw the Thessalonians do. When they started to respond, when they turned, they turned, remember, to serve a true and living God. That's the first thing they did. The second thing they did is they developed an attitude of waiting. Verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us out of the coming wrath. This is not only a verse loaded with a lot of things we need to look at carefully, but one that is often uh, brings a difference of opinion among groups of Christians. But let's begin to look at it first. The word to wait. Uh, not only this is a rare Greek word, but it's the only time it's used in the New Testament. Onameno. It means to wait for, expect. It's the word for expecting. You're waiting with a sense of expectation. What are they waiting for? What are they expecting? Think of it. New believers hearing the word, starting to grow in the word, and they immediately begin to develop an attitude of expectation. And what are they expecting? What are they waiting for? They are waiting for his son from heaven. The believer's expectation is to be waiting for the Son of God to descend from heaven. They heard the stories. They were taught. They were told that Jesus is coming back. Now, some point will be made about the coming of the Lord Jesus in every chapter in this epistle. In fact, you can get a pretty good picture of what some of the major events are surrounding the coming of the Lord. We can look at some of these passages. In fact, let's do that. We've got, we've got some time to do that. Let's look, at, uh, let's look at five of them. Every one of these passages in just 1 Thessalonians mentions something about Jesus' coming. I want to put them up here as if they were a doctrine. So it'll be up here, half of it will be up here at a time, I believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? It is, is it not you? So here we see that the coming will involve reward. And particularly here, the fact that these people have responded to the word, they themselves become sort of the trophies. There's an evaluation when he comes. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. Uh, 5.23 May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple more things we see, one in chapter 4 and one in chapter 5. We see in chapter 4 about the resurrection. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, 
will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So again, we see the subject of the coming of the Lord. He comes unexpectedly. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So looking at this subject of the coming of Christ is a thick thread that runs through both of these epistles. The coming of Christ with reward, uh, with the other events that come with it, was a much anticipated event in the days of the apostles. Now, if you know the teaching of Jesus and some of the parables that he taught, he taught about the importance of waiting. You remember the parable of the ten maidens and other perils, but spoke. And some of them times he spoke directly to be ready. Matthew 24, 44, Luke 12, 40, to be ready for his coming. If you were with me in James, we saw this in James also. The coming of Christ was considered near. James 5, 8. So that it was a common attitude among believers I'm going to show you from several epistles, to be eagerly anticipating Jesus' return. And we'll begin to look at them in our next lesson. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your precious word and what it means to us. We thank you for your spirit, and we ask that he will challenge us in what we've heard to get these things down deep into our hearts and minds so that we might apply them, that we might be discerning, that we at the same time realize that we too are to be examples as we grow spiritually to tell others of Jesus and use our spiritual gifts to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.